All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with James Fry. We're at Trisadum Wines in Newburgh, Ribbon Ridge. Uh, it's February 24th, 2020. Thank you so much for joining us today, James. You bet. Uh, first question, most important question, uh, why wine? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. The, the short answer is wine's amazing. It's, uh, it's just living. Um, it, it has a sense of place. It has a sense of time. The, the long answer as to why wine, that, that's maybe a little bit more complicated. I didn't, I didn't grow up um, with, um, with wine. I didn't have wine on the, on the dinner table when I was a kid. I came to it uh, later, later in life. Uh, and, and quite frankly, a little bit by, by chance. My, my wife, Andrea, who at that point was my wife, uh, we were in grad school together um, and we had recently graduated, got our business degrees and um, decided to get married. And at the time, we, we didn't have any money. Um, and so the cheapest honeymoon we could find, and the one, the one that we could afford, was to go camping. And so that was what we decided to do. We had lots of student debt at, at the time, and so we could afford to go, to go camping. And we were living in Arizona and had decided that we were going to go to California and camp in Yosemite. We thought that would be beautiful, and so a little, little road trip. And it just so happened that that year, the snowfall in Yosemite had been so great you know, over the winter that when we got there, this was in June, um, we, we couldn't get in the park. It was, the roads were closed, and so here we are on our, um, on our honeymoon, um, stuck with, with nowhere to go. And so kind of by chance, what we decided was, well, let's just keep heading west and we'll go to Napa. And we heard that's beautiful and wine's great and, and let's, let's see what this is all about. And so, so that's what we did. Um, so it wasn't planned. Um, it hadn't snowed a lot in, in, in the winter. Maybe this never happens, but we spent four days um, and, and fell in love. Um, not just with the wine, but with just the ethos, um, the agriculture. Um, and so that kind of sparked uh, our, our love affair. Um, fast forward a couple of years and we, we bought a house and the house had a little one acre piece of land attached to it and so I decided I was going to plant a vineyard and I'm going to start making wine and that was a garage wine in, in the truest sense. Um, and I'm growing the fruit in my backyard and making it in my garage. Um, and then it just it kept kind of blossoming and, and it became a, a passion. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the same time, uh, we had our, our children, Tristan and Tatum. Tristan is named after mm -hmm. our kids, um, Tristan and Tatum. And, and we had always wanted to raise our kids in, in Oregon. Um, mm -hmm. When my wife and I had our very first date, um, we found that we had two things in common. Um, the first was that we thought that Kate Jackson was the best Charlie's Angel. Um, she, was, she was the smart one, so we both thought she was, she was the best. And then the second thing we had in common is that we both wanted to raise our families when we had families in, in Oregon. We had both done internships before we knew each other. Um, when we were in business school, we had done internships in Oregon and both fell in love with, love with the state. So kind of what happened is we had this growing love affair with, with wine, um, kind of colliding with this desire to raise our, our kids in, in, in Oregon and, and our love affair with wine had kind of moved to a, a really a love affair with Pinot Noir and Riesling. Those are the two grapes, the two wines that, that we really enjoyed. And so those two things together kind of pointed to the Willamette Valley as a place that, that maybe made sense for us. And so we, um, we started looking and we found a piece of land outside of McMinnville. Uh, four and a half miles outside of, uh, basically from Linfield, um, up into the eastern foothills of the, of the Coast Range. Um, so we call it our Coast Range Estate. It's actually at that time was the southern western corner of the Yamhill Carlton ABA. Mm -hmm. It still is in the Yamhill Carlton ABA. And so um, we moved our kids here, and we planted a vineyard, and 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 then fortunately. Um, my business career had taken a, a positive turn and um, had allowed us the funds to not only plant that first vineyard, um, but enough that I, I was able to leave corporate America. Um, we found this piece of land here on Ribbon Ridge where we were able to plant a second vineyard and, and build a winery. And, and at the ripe old age of 39, I, I left my job and, and, um, and here we are 15 years later. Well, yeah. 
Amazing. 17 years later from when we started, um, but yeah. Amazing. So we'll get back to that in a second, but I'm curious, obviously, besides wine, you've done a number of other interesting things. So tell me about, uh, obviously, photography being the first one. So tell me yeah. about your, your interest in photography and your, sort of your career with it. Yeah, so um, I, I, yeah, I started, um, I, you know, I was, one of, I was one of those kids, I have a, my, my birthday is December 31st, um, so my tax write-off beat. And, <laughs> and it, it's an actually true story. They, my, the, the doctor asked my father if they wanted to induce me so I would be born in one year versus the other, and he said yes, um, save a few months, save, save a, few, a few dollars. And so the, the downside of that is that Christmas and, and my birthday are always together. The, the upside of that is that um, sometimes I can combine my gifts. And so when I was 12 years old, I asked my, my parents if they would um, get me a starter darkroom mm -hmm. kit. Um, and uh, we were living in a farmhouse, and so my dad created this little dark room in the basement and um, and so I started uh, started photography and I was you know fortunate right place right time when I was 15 um, I got a job working for a newspaper and I started um, working full-time through high school um, it's a fun career as a teenager and so uh, when I went off to college um, I was the first kid in, in my family to, to, to go to college and um, you know, I was going to have to put myself through, and, and fortunately, I had photography, and that's why when I when I, I went to um, did my undergrad at, at Berkeley, uh, University of California, and I was able to get a job um, as a photographer um, for with the men's sports information department, taking uh, photos of football games and basketball mm -hmm. games, and then I was able to get another job with the women's athletic department, which was apparently two different departments. But um, and so for my years at Cal, I, I basically worked pretty much full-time um, uh, in photography, mostly sports photography, which was a lot of fun. And, um, and it was great. It, was a, it, it helped pay my way through college, um, gave me something to do, kept me on the straight and narrow. Um, uh, and then once I graduated, I, was, um, I, I just felt like I'd been doing photography for so long. And I, you know, I got a business degree, and I was I wanted to, to go into business, and so um, I, I kind of quit and retired, and and that's actually where painting came along later. In that, um, after about a year or so of not doing anything creative and spending all my, you know, my my week looking at spreadsheets and finances and numbers. I needed something more, more, uh, you know, uh, right brain to do, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. just left brain, and, and so I took up painting, and that's that's kind of how painting started, as kind of the next step of, of my photographic career, and, and and then painting has become a, a an equal passion to, to art. Mm -hmm. How about how do they how do they differ? How, what are the similarities and differences mm -hmm. from photo photojournalism, especially, and, and your painting? Um, so photography, uh, it, that's, that's, a, that's a great question because I, I think I became the painter that I became because I wanted this to be the exact opposite of photography. So as a photojournalist, your job is to depict reality, right? So I'm, I'm, my job was to take pictures of something that was going on and make it look like what was going on. Um, and it was black and white back in those days. Mm -hmm. um, this was still old school, dark room, film, you know, chemicals, all that stuff. Um, and then it was two dimensional. So mm -hmm. photographs are flat. So when I started painting, I wanted to get as far away from photography as I could get because I kind of knew, I knew that if I, if I decided I was going to like, if I wanted to paint a flower, um, it would, um, uh, I would always be able to photograph it better. So why do realism? So I immediately started painting abstract, abstract expressionist. I wanted big, bold colors because I couldn't do that in photography and I wanted texture. I wanted to be able to use, um, thick paint and create texture on canvas so that, again, something different than the two-dimensional. So my photography and my paintings ended up being very different in that my paintings are much more abstract, abstract expressionist, lots of color, lots of texture, much bigger too. With ph photographs, I was limited, you know, a lot of eight by 10 um, photography. I could, you know, as a, as a painter, I could go big and I could do stuff that's much, much larger. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so I want to backtrack now to your you're you're in Napa and you're and you're and you're on your honeymoon, your accidental honeymoon in Napa. Yeah. And you've you've 
sort of you're starting to fall for for wine. Tell me, you mentioned the ethos of it, the agriculture of it. I'm curious if you can sort of pinpoint what it was that made it not only just a passion for you, but something you wanted to actually do yourself. Was there something about it that made it something you wanted to, to be a part of yourself? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great question. Um, it was it wasn't in a tasting room, which was in, so it wasn't that we were sitting there tasting wine and thinking this wine is delicious. We were in there, but. It's when we were walking, when my wife and I were walking through the vineyards and, and, and just that, that sense of doing something with the land, with the earth, and then being able to create a product that is a representation of that. Um, I think that's what was appealing. I think that's what kind of just um, triggered something that this is, this is really a, an, an amazing lifestyle. It's actually, it, there's a side story to this. When I, my very first job, when I had just gotten my, my MBA, and at this point, my mindset was I'm going to be a corporate titan, right? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm you know, this is, I'm going to be a business guy. And they made me take this psychological profile. It's like this three hour exam that was supposed to tell me you know, where in the company I was going to be a good fit or what, what, what kind of, you know, business person I was going to be. And so I took this whole exam and um, I, I get hired. And then and my first week they bring me in and they said, you know, we almost didn't hire you. And I said, well, why, why would you not? Why, why do you want to hire me? Like, because your psychological exam, your psychological exam said that the perfect job for you was to be a farmer. And, and at that time, I, mean, I just, I laughed. I'm like, that's silly. That doesn't make any sense. I'm a business guy. And then, yeah, here I am now, and I'm I'm a farmer. Um, yeah, so it, it, so apparently there was something there that that connected um, somewhere in in somewhere in there, and so that's um, so I think there was just something about about the place and the ability to to create something and build something that that also stands the test of time and we you know we were walking through there and there was some history there were some you see these bottles that were 20 and 30 and 40 years old and and that was just something that was appealing as well to say hey we can we can do something that lasts mm -hmm. i think it's the same thing about painting as well is that there's the ability to create a, a, a work of art that 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 lasts beyond beyond you mm -hmm. and there's something appealing about that mm -hmm. So tell me about the first vineyard, though the backyard vineyard uh, oh, gosh. here in California. Yeah, point. we're in California. We're in Southern California, and um, that's where I was. Uh, that's where I was headquartered at the time and, and working. And and so it's in Laguna Hills. It's still there. Um, there the, the, the original Tristano vineyard is still um, in in Laguna Hills, and it was it was this it was this um, again one acre uh, terraced backyard. So we were on this hillside, and it was terraced. And when we moved in, it was just covered in dead ice plant there was you know and so we the, the first summer we said we tried we replanted all the ice plant we thought this is what we were supposed to do um and it all died again and so i went to my wife and i said you know this is silly i i don't want to grow ice plant i i want to i want to grow grapes and we had just had tatum and so she was very supportive she's like look outside you can do it you support the tristan and tatum here inside the house but outside in the backyard you can do anything you want and so um, she gave me permission, and I just I put in this vineyard. It was um, Cabernet, um, Cabernet Sauvignon, and uh, Syrah. Because I, you know, it was Orange County. There wasn't really any other grapes being grown in in, in the area, um, and so um, I figured it was hot. It was warm, and um, and they actually, they 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 did pretty well. The, the grapes did pretty well. My winemaking. Meh. Um, I, I've learned since then, but it was a, it was a good it was a good learning experience. So. How how did you go about learning? Did you were, was it just hands on yeah. trial and error? Did you do a lot of uh, was there background research? How, how did you learn? Yeah, um, yeah. For better or for worse, I, I tend to um, uh, I tend just to trial and error things, um, and and just keep trying and working and and seeing what seeing what works and so uh, there was a certain amount of research um, this was right you know the internet was just getting going at this time so it's not nearly as easy to, to find information um, as, as it was as it is today mm -hmm. but um, so some of it was uh, research um, some of it was talking to you know talking to the 
the nursery that sold me the vines mm -hmm. and, and what they thought would work well and what rootstock would work well and um, and but it, but it was mostly trial and error and and that was that that was a lot of it and, mm -hmm. and um, fortunately when we started doing it for real there were a lot of really smart good helpful people that it wasn't just all trial and error I was able to actually um, ask a lot of questions mm -hmm. of some really really great people I'm curious about the the process itself of growing grapes and then of making wine especially in a garage what what surprised you about the process as, as, as someone who had never done it before what, what was interesting or different about the process that you weren't expecting uh, that it worked to tell you the truth I mean a that these grapes actually survived these vines didn't die um, they actually produced some pretty good fruit and and it and it it turned into wine that I could share with friends and family and 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 it, it so I think the biggest surprise was that was 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 that it worked and, I, and in some respects we can be very complicated about winemaking um, sometimes when you get uncomplicated um, it, it works and and maybe it's a little bit less of the manipulation and more of just letting mother nature um, do do what she knows how to do and and I think that's where some of those early years there was very little manipulation I was it was a very simple process of, of growing the fruit tasting it I didn't have um, refractometer to decide where where the bricks was the first vintage so I literally tasted until I thought they were at the right level of sweetness and acidity and, and they actually turned out turned out pretty good and 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 then I so I learned early on that taste is is a, a really important component of, of winemaking and um, and then you would have things that happen along the way and you start to learn some of the science that makes it a lot easier mm -hmm. when you when you actually do it for real mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious how you how Pinot Noir and Riesling became the the grapes du jour for you a, 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 before you got to Oregon. That was what you were thinking. So how did that happen? Yeah. So um, so we were in California, which is obviously a, a you know a bigger red heavy state. Um, but the, the wines that that my wife and I just seem to gravitate towards on the red side certainly Pinot, wines with a little bit more nuance, a little bit more elegance, um, wines with uh, maybe. Um, Wines that weren't, you didn't wait 15 years to have to drink them. The tannins were, were more integrated and more resolved. And then on, on the white wine side, it had always been Riesling. Mm -hmm. You know, I, my, my family is from Alsace. Um, and so I'm fairly confident that there's some DNA something that makes me love Riesling. Mm -hmm. And I love, and we love Riesling, we love dry Rieslings. Bone dry Rieslings, we loved medium dry, um, Spätlese, we loved Baron Auschleser, Trocken Baron Auschleser, dessert Rieslings. And so it was a grape that for us, we there was such versatility and flexibility to it. You could, depending on what, what food you were eating. Um, and, and it was one of those early grapes. It was one of the very first wines we ever, um, we ever had um, that we, and we just, we just loved it from the beginning. And so, and knowing, Oregon was a, a cooler viticultural climate. Um, we really felt like when, when we started that Pinot Noir and Riesling were going to be you know, our red and our, and, our, and our white grape. So let's talk about the, the first vineyard here then, the one in McMinnville, yeah. that you're, or outer McMinnville that, yeah. you, that you found. How did you, you decided Willamette Valley, how did you come across that particular piece of land? What were you looking for? Yeah, so we were still um, living in Southern California at the time. So this was our first stair step of, all right, we need to, if we're, if we're going to get to Oregon before our kids get into grade school, um, we're going to need to get a piece of land and we're going to need to get this thing started. And so um, I sent out a, a bunch of emails to any name I could find. Um, of people that that were in the Oregon wine industry and, and at that point we had we had kind of settled in the Willamette Valley just with Pinot Noir and Riesling kind of being our focus and where we were where we were heading and um, and Kevin Chambers was the first person that um, that sent an email back to me um, and what a stroke of fortune um, Kevin's you know one of the just the pioneer viticulturalists here in the Willamette Valley um, super nice guy and um, yeah like within an hour he'd sent me something back and and so we started talking and I told him what, what my vision was and so um, so we started looking um, he introduced me to Lisa Neal 
um, Scott and Lisa Neal from Quarter Terra. Lisa Neal at that time was was doing a lot of real estate transactions, and and so, but then they had just started their vineyard and their winery, um, and and then Kevin introduced me to Matt Novak, um, Results Partners at the time, and and so that threesome of individuals were, were just amazing mm -hmm. and uh, answered all my questions. We started looking. Um, I would fly up here. I had business in, in Portland at the time, and so I would, I would work during the week, and then I would spend my weekends here looking at potential vineyard sites uh, with them. And, and we kept looking, and we kept looking, and then um, it was one of those just, when you drive up to it, and you walk up that property, it was, this is it. There's mm -hmm. just, there's, there was no question. Um, and, um, and so we made an offer and, um, uh, you know, my, my parents at the time were retiring and um, uh, they didn't really have something to retire to. And this particular piece of land had a old farmhouse at the bottom of it. And I said, if you guys want to move into the farmhouse and you can, restore it knowing my parents and that's what that's what they did and help us get this vineyard started and and so my mom and my dad um uh it, it became a family affair you know three generations uh helped plant that vineyard from the very beginning because my parents were there my kids were there and obviously my wife and i and so uh with kevin's help and matt's help and luke padati's help and scott and lisa neil's help um you know we the, the piece of land had already been cleared. It, it, it had been cleared back at the turn of the century. Uh, it was an old cattle ranch. Uh, in fact, the former, back in the 50s, the Linfield football coach uh, lived in the house. So there's a Linfield connection there. Um, and, uh, and anyway, it, had, it hadn't been used, the, the, the land itself hadn't been used for anything in, in years. Mm -hmm. And so most of it, prepping it, was to take off the barbed wire. There's one horse that was living on the property. We took off the barbed wire fence cleared out the, the blackberry bushes and the hawthorn. And, um, and then, um, and the original plan was to plant kind of five acres at a time and slowly develop it. And things in the business world um, uh, got good. And so we ended up planting the entire thing in, in 2005. So we purchased the land in 2003. Um, we started building a house in 05, planted the entire vineyard in 05. Uh, it's a 52 acre property, but we planted, uh, we wanted to keep a lot of the property in, in native habitat so that everything surrounding the prop, the, the round, surrounding the vineyard, we, we left the same. We just planted the, the area that had, that had been cleared 100 years ago. So that's about 22 acres. So we planted that, we, we built the home and um, moved up here in, uh, for good in 2006. It's a lot of life change at one time. <laughs> Moving to Oregon, bringing the parents along, having the kids, vineyard. Did it was it a pretty smooth transition? <laughs> it, hindsight, it's everything was rosy, right? Because it, it turned out great, and yeah, I, 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 I it, it was in the, in the grand scheme of things. I mean, there there are lots of um, it's just a lot of work. It's not a everyone you've talked to will tell you the same thing. It's not, a, it's not an easy turnkey kind of operation. There's a lot to consider and there's a lot of work that has to be done. Um, but um, yeah, it, it, really, it really did, it worked so well getting that vineyard up and running and, and having my parents and being able to move up here full time. Um, it worked well enough in 2005 that in 2006 we started looking um, uh, well, actually, it worked so well in 2004 and 2005 that we started looking in 2005. And in fact, the end of 2005, after we had planted the, the Coast Train site, is when we found uh, this site here on, on Ribbon Ridge. And we maybe we were overly confident that, oh, we got this, this is easy, <laughs> um, that, we, that we purchased, that we were able to purchase this piece of land, and, and then we planted this vineyard in, in 2007. Mm -hmm. So. So tell me about the, the kind of the skills you needed to learn to go from a one acre backyard vineyard to a 22 acre vineyard and then to a second site vineyard. Yeah, in, in my one acre backyard vineyard, I didn't need a tractor, <laughs> um, right? I could walk the one acre and do everything by, uh, do everything by hand. Uh, when we go to a 22 acre vineyard, um, it, you, you're not gonna do that by yourself, right? And so we're really fortunate. Um, we, uh, we worked with Results Partners, uh, so Matt and, and Luke um, and their crew 
um, helped us put that in. Um, and, you know, just the, the, all of the challenges of, you know, in a, in a backyard you're constrained to a, a little tiny parcel of land and you're just going to fit it in there. With a, a bigger piece of land, you're, now you're looking at aspect, you're looking at elevation, you're looking at row orientation, you're looking at, you know, what varietals are you going to plant? What rootstock are you going to use? Um, we decided from the very beginning to dry farm all of our sites. Uh, it's one of the benefits, I think, of living in the Willamette Valley is, my personal belief is you don't need irrigation. Um, we, and, and so we've dry farmed from the beginning. Um, so that was something we didn't have to worry about. Um, and we had, to, we, we had to irrigate our backyard vineyard in, in Orange County. Um, luckily, the, the dead ice plant had a previous irrigation system that I was able to kind of cobble together for the, for the vineyard. But here in the Willamette Valley, we've, we've been able to dry farm. Um, and then you've got the, the bigger decisions of how, how are you going to farm this thing? How are you going to, you know, what chemicals are you going to use? Are you going to use chemicals? Are you going to be organic? Are you going to be biodynamic? And, and so we decided from the beginning, if we're going to do this, let's build this, let's put this vineyard in and let's, let's grow uh, these grapes for our, our grandchildren. Um, we, we didn't have, I still, I don't have grandchildren. Um, I mean, our kids were six and four at the time, so they didn't have grand, you know, they didn't have kids. But the idea was let's, let's have this long term and let's do things that has a 20 or 30 or 40 year horizon to them. And let's 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 put the right vines in the right place. Let's let's treat this land, keeping the natural habitat, um, not creating a monoculture um, farm, which I think is really important in in both of the vineyards that we put in. Trying to keep as much of the native areas, trying to keep as much of the native plants as possible, um, not spraying herbicides. Um, again, the, the dry farming. Uh, we've moved to no-tilling. Uh, we tilled a little bit in, in the beginning, but, but again, trying to create um, uh, a, a sustainable, regenerative agricultural system where the number of inputs that we have to bring in are, are minimal. And so since we've started, you know, all of our skins and seeds and stems get composted. Um, they go back into the vineyard. Um, our goal is really to try to bring as little onto the site as, as possible. If I can convince my wife, who grew up on a dairy farm, so she knows cows. I would love to get, <coughs> excuse me, our own, our, our own farm, um, but she grew up on a dairy farm, so she knows what's involved. And so she's not agreed to bring in farm animals yet. But that whole kind of closed system um, opportunity is something that I think is is something that we strive to do in, in, in our farm. And so all of those decisions, if you make them early on, it's a lot easier to not destroy what was already there. Uh, is if you destroy it, then getting it to come back is a, is a lot more work. So we've, we've been fortunate that we were able to, to kind of keep a lot of, of what was on both of the sites when we put the vineyards in. I'm curious what made you want to start another project so soon after yeah. the first project. What, what made this site so desirable at that, at that point? Um, my wife would say it's because I'm never satisfied and impatient and always looking for something else to do. Um, and so there's probably some kernels of truth in there. It, when we, once we started, I mean, we loved it. We loved putting that first vineyard in, um, the excitement of planning it out and sh seeing these vines show up and then putting them in the ground and I'm the whole family around as you're sitting there planting these. Um, it was something that we wanted to, I wanted to do it again. And I wanted it to, I mean, I was also at that point really under, starting to understand, still barely understand, but starting to understand the, the ability of grapevines, particularly Pinot Noir and Riesling Chardonnay as well now, to be able to take what's in the sand, in the soil, in the site, and, and put, it in, put it in the glass. And so the idea of getting another vineyard with completely different soils um, nearby, but with a different elevation and a different climate, a different microclimate, 
um, so that the Pinot Noir that we grow in the Coast Range versus the Pinot Noir that we grow someplace else could be two completely different wines. Mm -hmm. And so, so we started looking, and that was I actually um, I went to uh, Lisa Neal again, and, and I said, Lisa, I'm looking for, and Matt Novak actually at the time, and I said, I'm looking for something different than Coast Range. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, different soils, just a different a different site, and um, the literally within 24 hours, Lisa came back and said, "There's going to be this piece of land. It's not on the market yet. It's going to go on the market in the next 24, 48 hours, um, and it's this hazelnut farm up on Ribbon Ridge, and um, and uh, at that time." Um, we hadn't moved up yet, so I was in Southern California. But fortunately, Google, Google Earth um, had just come into existence, and so I pulled up this piece of land that we're sitting at right now on Google Earth, and all I really needed to know was that you could look at this, and you could see the aspect, you could see the elevation, mm -hmm. so I knew the elevation, I knew the aspect, and then I saw on one side of the road was, uh, was Brick House, and on the other side of the property was Beaufrere, and and Patricia Green. And I said, all right, so we've got Brickhouse, Bofer, and Patricia Green surrounding this hazelnut farm. I'm, I'm buying that, I'm buying it. Um, and, and so without ever actually seeing the, um, the, the actual piece of land other than Google Earth, um, I, we made an offer and, um, and, and they accepted. Um, and, and maybe it's because they didn't have to list it because anyway. Um, and, and so, yeah, sudden, suddenly we're on Ribbon Ridge and it's a stroke of for good fortune. Uh, it's a great neighborhood. It's a great place to, and, and we decided that we wanted to live on our first vineyard mm -hmm. and we wanted to put our winery on, on the second mm -hmm. so that we, my wife was smart enough to know to keep those separate for me mm -hmm. um, so that otherwise if we lived on the same site I would always be at the winery and never never be home um, and so anyway uh, so that that was the plan and and so we uh, this was a hazelnut farm so it did take a little bit of clearing and hazelnut farming can be pretty rough on the soil mm -hmm. um, you know the idea with with nut trees is you want the ground to kind of be as as clean cultivated as possible nothing growing and so there's a lot of compaction. Um, and so when we took out the hazelnuts, we, we took an entire year of kind of working the soil, amending, um, trying to restore um, just that, the health of, of the soil before we put the vines in. So we actually purchased the piece of land in, in 2005 and um, uh, we, we didn't plant the vineyard until 2007. So uh, we were also fortunate at that time, just a little aside, um, this piece of land, the property had a house on it and a lot of the asking price for the piece of land was in the house mm -hmm. and, and we had built our home and, and we didn't really need the house and so I was fortunate enough, I had a friend, um, Pete and Liz McKinley, who, um, who were interested in living on a vineyard and so I went to them and I said, it's not a vineyard today but it will be a vineyard tomorrow and, and they, we kind of partnered up and, um, and they got the house and we kind of split up the land. I, we planted the whole 28 acres mm -hmm. all together and then divided the property into, into two. It was already two tax lots mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they have an 11 acre vineyard, Norris McKinley Vineyard, which is right next to us here. And then the Trisadum Ribbon Ridge Vineyard is the 17 acres. Um, but again, very fortunate that had we had not found someone who wanted the house, we weren't really in a financial position to be able to, to buy the property and, and the house too. And so, um, again, just very fortunate along the way, um, just the right place and the right time and the right people that have, have, have been there along the way. Tell me about how these, now that you've had these, both these sites for over a decade and you're fairly familiar with them, tell me about, you, you wanted different, you wanted them to be different, you wanted variety. Tell me about how they differ, how they differ be, between the two sites. Yeah, they're wildly different. <laughs> I mean, they're only 20, they're only 13 miles as the crow flies. Um, uh, but they are just way different in the, in the wine world. So Ribbon Ridge, we'll start the site that we're at here. 100% um, sedimentary soils, very sandy, drains very fast. So when you dry farm on Ribbon Ridge, uh, you, you have to be aware that your vines are, may show a little water stress, especially in those early years. This is a warmer site. We, our aspect, we tilt a little bit to the west, so we're getting a little bit more evening sun. Um, less big trees around this site, Coast Range, on the other hand, a um, little higher elevation. Definitely, we kept so much of the trees in place for the native habitat that vineyard gets more shaded. 
it's windier. Mm -hmm. um, the coast range has more volcanic soil, mm -hmm. uh, better water, hold, water holding capacity. It does have some sedimentary, so it has this mix of sedimentary that you would find in the Amal Carlton, plus some more volcanic soil. Um, and so, they're, even though they're only 13 miles apart, both in the middle of Wyoming Valley, I planted the same plants on both of them. I farmed them exactly the same way. Pinot Noir, I can, there can be a three week to almost four week difference from when I start picking Pinot on Ribbon Ridge, the warmer site gets picked first, to when I'm done picking Pinot Noir on Coast Range. Mm -hmm. And then there's a six week difference from when I start picking Pinot on Ribbon Ridge to when I pick Riesling off of Coast Range. So even though I thought, I mean, I knew they were different, but, and I think the wines end up being very different. I think, again, if you, if you don't overly manipulate um, and you let the site speak, um, I, I think you really do see, you see on Ribbon Ridge, some of the, in Pinot Noir, um, some of the classic characteristic, the spice characteristic, the nutmeg and clove, little darker fruit profile, um, where my coastering site, cooler, more volcanic soil, um, more elegance, less of the power, um, a little bit um, earthier, more red fruited. Um, and again, I, I try not to do anything different from farming to fermentation to elevage to how they go into the bottle. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing has happened on the Rieslings too. So the Rieslings off of Ribbon Ridge, um, just had a reporter yesterday ask me this exact question. Um, the Rieslings off of Ribbon Ridge, a little richer, a little bit more evolved fruit profile. Um, for whatever reason, the Rieslings show a little bit more minerality off of Ribbon Ridge. Coast range, more precise, um, more electric, more uh, acidity and precision, um, more crystalline structure to those Rieslings. And so, again, being able to have these two sites um, and being able to treat them identically and get completely different wines um, it is awesome. And I think a lot of us in the Willamette Valley, we, you know, we, one of the reasons we're attracted here is that the grapes you grow here do show a site, show place, and, um, and there's so much soil diversity and there's so much site diversity in the Willamette Valley that you really can get very different, different wines even if you're doing everything the same. And I think that's fun. And then we did end up with a third vineyard um, that again was just one of those luck things. Uh, we call it our Wickman Dundee um, estate. Um, it's actually owned by Ann and Dave Wickman. Um, Dave is the CEO of United Healthcare. Um, we met back in the business world and we were having um, dinner one night and he's like, I really love this, this Trisatum thing. I would love to be a, a part of it. And I said, well, Dave, I, I kind of have, I have what I need, but if you ever find an old vine vineyard in the Dundee Hills, I would love it. I would manage it. I'll, I'll take all the fruit. We'll, we'll make wine. And, um, and a, a month later, um, <laughs> he had purchased uh, the, the vineyard and, and um, it, uh, it was this, this is beautiful site. Um, highest elevation of all, my, all three of my vineyards. Um, uh, it had a Pinot Gris planted on it and I don't, I, I don't make Pinot Gris. And so when uh, he was purchasing, I said, I'll, I'll manage this and we'll, they'll take all the fruit and we'll make the wines, but, but I want to graft over the Pinot Gris to, to Riesling. Mm -hmm. And he was willing to do that, so we took Budwood from our Ribbon Ridge site, we grafted it, and, and that Riesling off of that site is, is amazing. Um, it was, uh, that actual Riesling was the number three wine in the world with wine enthusiasts a few years ago. And, and so anyway, um, Pinot Gris is great, but on that particular site, it, those vines really wanted to be Riesling. So talk a little bit about, about this off camera before we started, but uh, tell me about Ribbon Ridge when, when you bought this property and, and what, what was going on here uh, at the time when you, when you got into here. Yeah, so um, I mean the Ridge was, the, you know, the original founders of the Ridge, Harry Peterson Edry with, with Shehalem up and his Ridgecrest Vineyard, uh, he was the first to plant. Um, and then a little bit after that you had, um, you had Mike Etzel and Doug Tennell, Mike Etzel from Beaufrere, Doug Tennell from, from Brick House. Um, and then Patricia Green. And so when we, we were fortunate, we kind of got to the ridge right as the ridge was exploding. Um, the Ribbon Ridge is not a very big AVA. It's only three miles long. It's a, it's a mile and a quarter wide. Um, and, and now at this point, here we are 
15 years later, and it's basically all planted out. Um, and there's not a lot of room for, for much more in terms of, of vineyards. It's not like Manhattan where you can keep going higher. You know, vineyards are one story, so it's, it's, it's kind of planted out. But back then, it was funny, when we built our winery here, one of our d decision points in building the winery was we were gonna have a tasting room. We wanted to have a tasting room and have an art gallery. And, um, uh, but no one else on the Ridge had tasting rooms at the time, or there were a couple of a couple of folks that were maybe open on on the weekends, mm -hmm. um, but there there weren't any tasting rooms kind of just generally open to the public, and it was one of those kind of question marks of you know should we do this? Are people going to drive out? Ribbon Ridge is a gravel road. Are people going to drive on this gravel road if we're the only? Thing open mm -hmm. um, now. Fast forward 15 years, and, and the ridge has kind of grown out, and there are all kinds of tasting rooms open um, all throughout the week, and it's great. So we're we're just very fortunate. It's, it's a wonderful community, um, really terrific one. Not just Beaufort and Patricia Green and, and Brick House and and the wines that Harry um, and Wynn are making at, at, at Ridgecrest, but you've got Eminent Domain up here now, and Utopia, and, and, and Ayers, and Araminta, and, and um, Domain Divio, um, Colin Clements, which isn't part of Ribbon Ridge, but just right next to Ribbon Ridge. Now suddenly all of these places are open and have tasting rooms, and, and it's a very different, um, it's just, it's, it's been fun, it's fun to see. It's still a little bit out of the way, you know, we're not off of, Highway 99, so uh, we tend to get traffic that come to the ridge because they've experienced the wines and, mm -hmm. and they're not just driving by to go someplace else. We're not really on the way to someplace else. Um, and so we do get folks that come to the ridge that really want to want to taste the wines from Ribbon Ridge mm -hmm. and, and there's really a lot of wonderful examples up here of, of really terrific wines that people are making. So we talked a bit earlier about how you're a, sort of a self-taught trial and error winemaker. Tell me about scaling again. Uh, we talk about yeah. vineyard scaling. Talk about wine scaling and yeah. suddenly making wine professionally uh, at the size you were making it once you got up here. Yeah, that's that's a that's a great question. And the key to that whole so um, I told you like all along the way I've been super fortunate and and, and Oregon is such a collegial and and giving wine community and I really think the pioneers inst instilled that kind of culture. And it, I think it still persists today. Um, so um, when I realized that I was going to go from one acre to at that, that point 22, and in the not too distant future, close to 40, um, I was going to need some help. Um, I didn't go to wine school. Um, I went to business school. Um, and and my first degree is in exercise physiology, which I really don't use at all. So I'm, I'm really good at doing things like photography and exercise physiology and business that don't have anything to do with, with art or, or wine. But um, I was fortunate, uh, uh, Matt Novak introduced me to Josh Bergstrom. Um, and this was back in 2005. And um, Josh had, had started uh, Bergstrom a few years before that and was looking to do some consulting. And we met and just hit it off. Uh, very like-minded. Um, he is as smart a business um, guy as he is a wine. He's an amazing winemaker. Mm -hmm. But there was a connection there of understanding the, the business of wine as well. I mean, there's a lot of romance to it and there's a lot of fun and there's a lot of creativity to vineyards and winemaking, but at some point um, there is a there's a business to it as well, and, and you have to be successful economically to be able to to do the things you want to do. And 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 Josh was was just brilliant on both the winemaking and on the business. And so we started working together, and I hired him as a consulting winemaker. He helped me build this winery. This winery is a testament to. 15 other wineries in the Wyoming Valley. So if you, it, we could go around this building and I could point out almost everything in this building is replicated someplace else. Originally there, mm -hmm. I, I replicated mm -hmm. it here. But that was, that's part of that Oregon ethos of that community. And so Josh took me around to, uh, to Archery Summit and Domain Serene and Domain Druin and, and Brick House and, and uh, Beaufrere and, and all these different you know wineries and they all had little things that that we saw and said that that could work for us and and they were the winemakers there were great because I could ask them I'd say what's the one thing you wouldn't that, that you you wouldn't spend money on again mm -hmm. or what's the one thing that you would have to have mm -hmm. if you started all over 
and you do that enough, you get a pretty good idea of what, what's really important and what's not. And I would say that 95% of this building I would build exactly the same way. And that's because of, of the work that Josh did and the work that all of these other winemakers who were so giving of their time and of their, of their expertise. And so that's how we started. Josh was um, our kind of consulting winemaker in, in 2007, 2008, our first two years, um, 2009. Um, uh, Greg McClellan, who um, Josh and I had hired back in 2007 when we first started, um, uh, he and I kind of became co-winemakers um, by 2009 uh, when Josh um, went full-time um, into uh, just working with Bergstrom. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that's kind of the that's kind of how it got started and it was uh, very fortunate for a, a, a guy who didn't get a chance to go to wine school um, to work with such amazing winemakers and 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 learn and then um, uh, in 2012 um, kind of became uh, uh, Greg uh, moved on and I became kind of the solo uh, winemaker here and so I've been doing that for the, the last eight nine nine vintages um, now um, in terms of my wine education, a really key um, figure um, in that is, is also Jacques Lardier from Louis Jadot. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jacques Lardier made wine in Burgundy for 42 years. Um, he retired in 2012 in, um, and 42 years at Louis Jadot. Uh, worked with over 100 wineries, 100 vineyards um, in Burgundy. Amazing, an amazing career. Um, retired in 2012. In 2013, Louis Jadot decided that they were going to buy a vineyard here in Oregon. So they bought, uh, just so happened, Kevin Chambers um, Residence Vineyard, um, the, the vineyard that Kevin Chambers put in. And Kevin Chambers then introduced Louis Jadot uh, to, to, to myself um, in that um, they were looking for a place to make wine because they had bought this vineyard, but they, did, they were eventually going to build a winery here, which they've now done. But um, back in 2013, they, they, hadn't, they, they hadn't done that. And so Kevin Chambers introduced uh, Pierre-Henri Gaget, uh, the, the owner, uh, president of Louis Jadot and Jacques Lardier. And so in 2013, they start making their Oregon wine here at Trisadum. And so for the next five years, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, um, I get to make wine side, you know, side by side with, with Jacques Lardier. Um, so he retired in 12, and then he spent the next five years um, coming here to Oregon and making wine here at Trisadum. And we were making his wine for resonance, but, but he's an amazingly gifted and amazingly um, spirited and giving individual. And the thing I learned from Jacques was just taste, taste, taste. Every time I'd ask him a question, he would never answer until he tasted. And it was, and it was, it was a great learning. It was like I would say, "Do you want to do this? You can do that." He's like, "I, I don't know. We'll see what to taste." Um, and so, he went. We tasted every single day, today. every single morning. We'd start the day. We taste our my ferments. We taste his ferments, and we did that for five years. And there's just no greater education. Or and so again, one of those right place, right time, fortunate um, situations. And so uh, Jacques has been a, a huge part of the wines I make today. Um, so this combination of Josh Bergstrom and, and Jacques Lardier. Um, and then I've also got, I've gotten to know Chris Figgins from Walla Walla um, really well because Chris Figgins and I started trading uh, fruit back in 2013. He wanted to make Pinot Noir from Ribbon Ridge and I wanted to make Cabernet Sauvignon from Walla Walla. This goes back to my wife saying that I'm never excited, so I didn't always want to try to do something else. And Chris actually approached me, so he, he's the one that came up with the idea. He said, let's just, let's just trade some fruit. I'll, straight up, um, you send me uh, uh, Pinot Noir from Ribbon Ridge, I'll send you Cabernet Sauvignon from Walla Walla. And we did that, and, and so um, working with Chris, um, I've learned a whole bunch about how to make Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot Petit Verdot, and that has informed my winemaking, not just with that project, but also with how we approach Pinot Noir and how we, how we do, you know, and so, anyway, um, just very fortunate to, to run into some really great people, and then, and now sparkling has become a big part of what we do, yeah. and that is um, very much the result of Andrew Davis and the work that he did when he started uh, Radiant Sparkling Company back in 2013, 2014. 
Uh, we started working together in 2014, and now sparkling has become a big part of what we do. I love making sparkling wine. And um, um, we do six different sparkling wines a year now. And Andrew, and I just learned an amazing amount from, from Andrew um, about sparkling wine and how to approach that. So my whole winemaking career is just being fortunate enough to run into really good people who were um, okay with me asking a lot of questions and, and being very patient with me in, in terms of answering them. What is the, what, what do you hope someone takes away from a bottle of, of, of your wine? What is, what is the ultimate Trisadum yeah. signature or, or, or for lack of a better word? Yeah, so that's a great uh, that's, that's a great question, um, and it's a bit cliche. And I know, and I'm going to say this, but this is the very first thing I tell my interns every single year. When we start, very first day, the first day they show up, um, I, I um, my old business side, we start with a lecture, and and I have a PowerPoint, and and the very first slide says, um, our goal is to taste the place. That's it. That's our goal, um, and so. When someone tastes a, a, a dry Riesling from Trisadum Ribbon Ridge, or a Pinot Noir from Trisadum Ribbon Ridge, or a, a single vineyard Blanc de Blanc from the Coast Range, I want them to taste that place. That's and, and I know we all we talk about place, but I, I really do think we're we're fortunate enough that we just do a state. We have our three vineyards. We just do those three wines plus the the trade that I do with Chris Figgins from Walla Walla. Um, but I want. I want. I, I would love for people, if they love dry Riesling, to be able to sit down and taste Ribbon Ridge, Coast Range, Wickman Dundee, side by side, same vintage. Mm -hmm. So the same plant material, they're farmed the same way, they're fermented the same way, they're in the same vessels. Um, the chemistry is really similar, I mean like the residual sweetness is almost identical. And, but they're three completely different wines. And their ability to be able to do that and go, wow, alright, I, I can taste sedimentary soil on a warmer site. Mm -hmm. I can taste 100% volcanic soil from a higher elevation vineyard. That, that for me, is, um, I think it's great. It's one of the great things that wine can do. Mm -hmm. It's one of the great things that the grapes we grow here in the Lambeth Valley, Pinot Noir, Riesling, Chardonnay, they, they can do that. Um, they're, they're very transparent. And so um, that's the lesson. It's the interesting lesson is that for my interns, when I first started, so listen, you're going to see a lot of winemaking. You're going to see a lot of stuff going on. But ultimately, our goal is to do as absolute little as possible. The less we do, the less we impact this wine, the better the wine's going to be. Mm -hmm. it took me a while to learn that. Um, I like making an impact. Um, I like to do things. I like to tinker. Um, I learned that the better wines um, or maybe when I'm, I'm tinkering less mm -hmm. and, and I'm stepping away. And so that means, um, I mean, I, I like that we dry farm our vineyards. Um, uh, we minimize the use of sulfur. We stop doing any kind of spraying in our vineyard really, really early on. That does present some risks, but I just want those, I want those grapes to be as pure as possible coming into this winery. Um, we don't use any sulfur in the, in the winemaking process to the very end. Um, we're na we use native yeast. Um, uh, we, we try to, do, you know, we use very little oak along the way. All these things that I think enzymes, tannins, yeast, too much new oak, all of those things take away place. Mm -hmm. Too much sugar. Um, all of those things for me um, are generic and don't represent, un unless you you know, I, I joke, unless you cut down an oak tree from your vineyard to make a barrel out of it, that the, the oak isn't placed. I'm not cutting, I'm not, I'm part of the Oregon Oak Accord, so I'm, I'm not cutting down any oak trees. I'm, I'm planting oak trees, I'm very supportive. But my point is that, that um, and we joke about this, and the interns, they, we get into this whole, every time they see me do something that didn't come from the vineyard, um, they call me on it, and I think it's great. And, and that's the whole idea is that um, it, we, so in terms of my wines, what I'm, I really do hope that we make a lot of different wines here, only from three vineyards, um, but we do 10 different Pinot Noirs, we do nine different Rieslings, we do six different sparkling wines. That's a lot of skews from only three sites, but I do think um, all those sites are so different and, and you're able to, um, if the site speaks, you can have a lot of different wines from the same place. 
You talked earlier about the, <coughs> your, the, the one of your Rieslings scoring very well with Wine, Wine Spectator. Uh, what does it mean to you when you get a, a high score from a, from a publication like that or have a wine served at a, a White House function or yeah. something like that? Tell me about the, what that means to you as the, as the owner and winemaker here. Uh, the White House was fun. Um, yeah, so we had a, we had a Riesling served at the Obama uh, State Dinner a few years back. I, you know, um, that's, a, that's a really good question. I think in the early days, I was much more concerned about that. Um, uh, the White House, I, I, I love. Uh, critics, I, I, I tend to spend less. Um, the, I, it's, it's, a, it's one person's palate, and it's great. Look, they, from, a, from my business side, um, they certainly can, can help, and we've been very fortunate that a lot of critics have said some very nice things and wrote very nice things, and so that, that certainly helped um, where, where we're at today. Um, but it's one of the things I try to impress even on, on our interns as well is that you need to make wines that you love, that you're passionate about, that you taste and say this is what, not necessarily what you think a critic's gonna love or not necessarily even what the consumer's going to love, I think if you're passionate and you and you do something that you want to do, that you'll find an audience for it. You'll find people that are passionate and that love it. And and don't chase scores and don't chase a certain demographic. Or I, I just think you have to do what you love. And so um, uh, so the scores are important um, because they 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 have a an, a, a business uh, a, a brand awareness. We're very we're small, right? We're eight thousand cases. Um, and we sell most of our wine direct to consumer right here in, in the tasting room. And so people have to hear about us. Mm -hmm. And so one way they do that is through publications. Mm -hmm. And so because our wine is not, we do have wine around the country and, 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 other, and in other countries, but, but not enough that, you know, it, that we're going to hit a large population. So people have to hear about us other ways, and that's going to be through media and mm -hmm. through stories and through um, and critic scores. And so all of that um, is, is important. Um, but in the end, I think you have to be true to yourself, and you have to make the wines that, that you love. And, and then the business will, will follow. Mm -hmm. You talked about working with the, the warmer varieties uh, from from the Walla Walla. Tell me about you mentioned you mentioned kind of learning a lot along the way about not just those varieties but winemaking in general. I'm curious how how it differs for you working with a hot grape from Walla Walla versus yeah. working from something from your estate. Yeah. Um, I, well, um, Pinot Noir is more complicated. I'll, I'll say that. I think we all say that uh, now that I've, I've I've been making Cabernet um, Sauvignon and Merlot. Um, uh, petite for dough. I, I'm not saying they're they're just um, uh, there's parts of them that are that are easier, um, but they're very different. And I've learned some stuff. So I used to um, I used to only punch down my Pinot Noir fermentations when I started doing cab. Um, you know, Chris said you really should you know pump over, irrigate, do some do something um, less aggressive than than punch down. And so we, we started doing that, and and it was great. And I loved the way the tannins um, kind of integrated. So we started doing it with our Pinot. And now I would say that 80% of our Pinot Noir fermentations are pumped over versus um, punched down. Um, and, and so that's something that I'm not sure I would have ever done had I not experienced it with what it did with, with Cabernet. And mm -hmm. um, longer elevage with Cabernet uh, has led me to be a little bit more comfortable with longer elevage on my, on my Pinot Noir. Um, so I think there's things that you learn along the way, even when you're working with different, there's something about being a specialist and only doing Pinot, and there's something that I, you know, I, I love about Burgundy, that they do two things, right? Pinot Noir and, and Chardonnay, and that's it. And a lot of places just do one or the other. Um, and you can get really, really, really good at that. Um, like Alsace, like they're doing, well, Alsace is doing a lot of different whites, but a lot of Riesling, right? Um, and, um, but I think there's something about doing sparkling wine and doing Riesling and doing Chardonnay and doing Pinot and doing Cab. Yeah, it's a lot to manage and it's a lot to think about. And there are a lot of times during harvest that I say, this is the last year I'm doing all of these. Um, but I think you learn something about all of that stuff. And, and I think it informs the other varietals. And I think you just get, I think you get better at, at 
at all of it by, um, you know, but you have to be careful about not overextending yourself mm -hmm. because um, then you start making mistakes and and then your wines really aren't what, the, what they should be. So there's this balancing act of, of doing a lot of different things, but also being centered enough and, you know, by staying small and only using a state fruit, it's allowed me to be able to do a lot of different varietals mm -hmm. because I'm not doing huge volumes of, of anything. And so um, I can still touch and taste every single ferment every single morning um, because at most I've got 20 tanks going and mm -hmm. I can taste 20 tanks. Mm -hmm. um, if we were, if we got bigger, if we were doing a lot more volume, um, and then that, that gets, that gets more difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we talked a little bit about earlier about, uh, what Ribbon Ridge looked like specifically when you got here. I'm curious what the Oregon wine industry more in general looked like when, when you got here, uh, 2005 ish yeah. and, and what it's, what's changed to today. What's, what's the different about it now that, uh, from the last 15 years? Yeah. It, um, there's a lot that's changed. There's a lot that has. What hasn't changed, I think, is the more important thing. It's still friendly and collegial and and helpful. It's it's an amazing industry. And again, I give I give the pioneers, the Dick Erathes and the Dick Ponzies and um, the David Letts, a lot of credit for when they started. They were very collaborative. The Susan Sokol Blossers, who worked together, and and that continued through the 90s, and it certainly was there in the 2000s when I started. I still think it's there today. I still see a lot of collaboration, a coll collaboration, a lot of working together, um, a lot of like-minded, a, a lot of a rising tide lifts all boats kind mm -hmm. of mentality. Mm -hmm. It's still there. We're still a very small wine region in the world stage. Mm -hmm. We keep getting bigger and, and, and more press and, and more people coming, but still small enough. And I love that. And I really hope my kids get to live in that that winemaking world and I really hope my, my grandkids, assuming I have grandkids at some point, get to live in that world as well. So what's changed? Um, there's just a lot more of everything, right? There's more vineyards, there's more wineries, there's more tasting rooms, there's more tasting rooms open seven days a week. Um, there's, there's, there's just more. Um, and and that's, I think that's fun. I think that's, that's exciting to see the growth. Um, and you know, it's still Pinot Noir, is still the economic engine. I don't, I don't see that changing. Climate change excluded, um, but uh, it, so I still think we're focused on Pinot Noir. Um, I think there are other air, other parts of this business that are, are exciting. What's happening with Chardonnay is really exciting. Mm -hmm. What's happening with sparkling wine? Sparkling wine for me is really exciting. So Pinot Noir is still king. Queen, um, but um, but I think there's other things that we're doing here in the valley that that are exciting. And I think the nice thing about the Willamette Valley, the nice thing about Oregon, is a um, we have a lot of different climates. We're not tied to just what you can do on this vineyard. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to, if I wanted to grow something else, there's other places in Oregon that I can go. Mm -hmm. I can go to higher elevations or lower elevations. I can go to warmer places or colder places. Um, I. Uh, so, which is which is exciting, and I think we'll keep doing it. There's an entrepreneurial spirit in Oregon. It was there in 2003 when I first got the e 2002 when I first got the email from Kevin Chambers. Um, I, I still see it today. I see a lot of of that that entrepreneurial spirit. People trying um, trying to keep making us better. Mm -hmm. I think the most important thing, and what's probably the most exciting thing, the wines are still great. They were great back in 2002 um i think they just keep getting better we just um not that there weren't there were great wines there i just think even as the industry is is getting bigger and there's more more vineyards and more wineries and more winemakers um they're doing really good work they're making really good wine and i think ultimately for this region um for willamette valley and for oregon that's the most important thing mm -hmm. for all the marketing that we can give it and there's there's really good marketing going on and and i think there's a lot of really good work going on there um at the end of the day it's the wines mm -hmm. that's the most important thing and that's the thing that that we always have to has to be the first thing mm -hmm. um, that we focus on make great wine and then the other all the other stuff works mm -hmm. so you just stop making great wine it's really hard to make everything else work so 
Yeah. So what do you see as you, as you look ahead for the Oregon industry? As you look 10 years into the future, what is it going to look like? Mm. That's a really great question. Um, I think I think we're going to see more and more people come to the Valley. Um, uh, I think there's a buzz right now about uh, about Oregon. There's certainly a buzz about the Willamette Valley. There's a lot of buzz around Pinot Noir. Um, and I think all of that leads to a continued growth um, of, of, the, of the industry. Um, I suspect, even though that parts of the wine industry globally and in the U.S. are slowing down, it doesn't feel like Oregon is quite slowing down. Um, and so I suspect if we keep making great wines, and keep doing the right things in terms of how we putting vineyards in the right spot, putting them them putting them in well. Um, I suspect we'll, we'll we'll keep doing well as as an industry. Um, I suspect we'll continue to grow. Um, maybe not at the same pace we've been growing. Um, we uh, there you know there's certain areas that you just can't plant anymore. Ribbon Ridge is a great example of you know um, Dundee Hills is starting to get pretty pretty full um, and so there's there's a natural slowing uh, just because mm -hmm. again it's, it's not like a city where you can go higher vineyards are, are one story so um, so I think that um, I think there'll be more consumer opportunities um, it certainly seems that for in this world uh, versus maybe back in, in 2000 when you could find a distributor in every state and sell your wine through distributors. Um, that's harder and harder every single year for small wineries. And so wineries are going to have to, I think, approach the direct-to-consumer as their, their core competency unless they're going to really play the economies of scale. And there's folks that have done that really well here in Oregon. Um, but the majority of us are going to probably stay small, mm -hmm. family-owned, and operated. And, um, and in that world, um, it's really about your relationship with individual consumers. And, and um, whether that's in your tasting room, whether that's through your wine club, whether that's through your e-commerce abilities, mm -hmm. I think all of those are going to continue to be important here in the next, in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then what about for yourself and for your brand as you look ahead? What's what's <laughs> next for, for Satum? Well, since you, um, since you can't stop dabbling. In yeah, no, I know. Things. Well, uh, my ultimate exit strategy is that Tristan or Tatum or, or both um, come uh, come back um, when they finish school and uh, and come into the into the wine business. Uh, so we'll see if that happens. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Tristan just finished up his business degree at, at Berkeley. Um, and uh, Tatum is a junior at the University of Oregon, so um, so I would love to see the second generation. Um, and uh, for me, um, I, I just love what I'm doing. I, I really do. Every day, I'm either I'm making wine, I'm making art. Um, it's it, I, I feel very fortunate, and and so I'm not really looking for um, anything bigger, anything broader. I, I really like what we do. We want to keep getting better. Um, I want my wines to keep getting better. The vineyards get better every year because they get older and they get more mature. Um, I want my art to get better. Um, and then eventually I, I want to pass it along. And I would love to see uh, the next generation come and, and, and then take it to a whole nother level from there. Um, mm -hmm. we, you know, we've just been very fortunate. We have a great team here. I have a lot of employees that you know we've only been open to the public for 11 years I have 11 year employees that have been here 11 years I have employees that have been in 10 years mm -hmm. employees that have been here nine years I mean we're not a very big team but but we're really I'm very fortunate that that I've got a great a group and so I'd love to see them stay and prosper and do well and that um, People just enjoy enjoy the wines that we make, the art that I make, um, and for me, that's that's very fulfilling. So um, I say that now. My wife would tell you that's that's not an accurate answer. I'm going to find something that I'm going to want to do, and um, but for now, I'm I'm really happy with what I'm doing right now. So if, if someone were to come to you and, and say they wanted to just get started in the Oregon wine industry, what would your words of wisdom to them be? Ah. Uh, you know, and I, and I said this to people, um, don't do it for money. Um, it's a really bad 
investment if you get into it thinking I'm going to make I'm going to make a lot of money. There are a lot better ways to make money. And obviously it's an expensive investment, right? So people that get into the wine industry tend to either have financial backing or they have some backing their own um, because it's not insignificant the cost to get started, especially if you do it the way we did it, where you buy land and you plant a vineyard and then you build a winery and then you make the wine, then you sell it, right? It was six years from when we started to when we sold our first bottle. So that's six years of expense. Um, that's not a great investment strategy. Um, so don't do it for that. Do it because you love it and you're passionate about it. Um, build it for your grandchildren, even if you don't have grandchildren, um, because then you're gonna do the things that build a, a long-term sustainable brand and product. If you do that, if you do it because you love it, and if you make decisions that have a 30-year, 40-year time horizon, I actually think it becomes a really good investment. Um, and that you, it can be, it can be a, a great business, um, and it can certainly be a great life. Um, but expect to work really hard. Mm -hmm. Expect it to not be easy. It's a very complicated business. It's a great business, but it's really complicated. There's a lot going on. It is not just one thing. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, there, it, it touches all aspects of everything you would ever learn in business school. So forget about just the science and the, the, the knowledge of making wine. Running a winery and selling wine is a very, can be a very complicated business. So um, understand you're going to work really hard. Understand that you need to do it because you love to do it. Make long-term decisions. Mm -hmm. And then you do that. It, 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 I think in Oregon, in the Willamette Valley, you've got a legitimate shot of it, it actually working out. Mm -hmm. um, but have a long-term horizon, right? So we, again, we started in 2002 um, when the first email I sent. So it's, it, it, you know, and it's little by little. It doesn't, it doesn't just happen like that. But um, keep building on that. And Oregon, just like Oregon, Oregon's industry, it's just, it just keeps building little by little, mm -hmm. and it gets better and better all, all the time. All the questions that I have for you today. Right. Uh, anything I didn't ask that I should have asked? Anything I, we didn't cover that we should have covered? Uh, no, no. It's been a, it's been a pleasure to talk to you yeah, and, and love the work that you're doing and look forward to seeing uh, more and more of these interviews over awesome. time. Thank you. Us too. So thank you so much. I will uh, let you off the hook. All right.